great. So, um, so yeah, so I'm a statistician. I work, you know, at, um, I was kind of trained working on some microbiology problems, and uh, I've kind of moved over a little bit into the defense aerospace realm. And uh, but I kind of gen generally just an applied statistician. And I thought I'd just present some of the um, thoughts I have um, on trying to make re research kind of reproducible, um, having worked in kind of a broad um, area. Uh, so this is work with myself um, and my collaborator Johan at the University of Michigan. And really tiny up in the in, in the corner there, we have a paper on archive um, which describes some of this some of this stuff. So we're talking about uh, an approach to reproducibility that hopefully can practically be applied and hopefully ensure the analyses really are actually reproducible. So I'll start here with our nice definition from the National Academies um, just to set up what we're going to be talking about. So uh, there's a study done by the National Academies a couple, a couple of years ago, and they defined reproducibility as kind of obtaining results. If I use the same code, the same data, I should be able to run the code on the data, get the same output. So this is what they defined as reproducibility. This is also sometimes called computational reproducibility. Uh, and they differentiate that from replicability, which is kind of more of the science, answering the, same, the scientific question. You're getting kind of the same scientific results. So that would be maybe I use a different method. Maybe I use different data, different code. Um, and trying to answer the same question, do I get kind of the same answer? Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about reproducibility or computational reproducibility. And it may seem that that's a really low bar, that actually just getting the code to run to reproduce the results should be pretty straightforward. But I think many of us have had the experience of that not actually working. Um, and while kind of the replicability problem is maybe the harder problem, um, reproducibility problem is a solvable. We have the tools to solve it, and so we should make sure that it is solved. And so that's, um, that's the kind of what I'm going to talk about today. So as I see it, um, there are kind of two broad challenges to, to getting to, to, to do computational reproducibility. The first be actually running the code. Um, and we've all had the experience of trying to get third-party code and data and run it and not being able to. And there are all sorts of language version issues, and dependencies, 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 directory structures being set up the right way. And in theory, these are, these are solvable. But it can be kind of this black hole of time trying to actually get the code and data to work sometimes. And even for very technical users, it can be complicated. And then for less technical users, um, it's just kind of a non-starter. So for example, here is a dependency um, graph of the R package LME4 for, fix, for fitting uh, mixed effects models. Um, this is actually one of the more well-behaved dependency graphs out there. So we have LME4 up the top. And these, all these, whatever, 30, 40 R packages are dependencies of LME4. So I have 30, 40 places for my installation to go wrong, for things not to work. And indeed, I have the package up in blue, the CMake. This is a, a system level dependency. And um, so this is a relatively well-behaved package. If you install something from, I don't know, Tidyverse in, in R, which is a great suite of, of software, they'll have hundreds of dependencies. Um, and so things can get pretty complicated. If it works, it works. It's easy. If it doesn't work, well, there goes a week of time trying to get it to work, right? In addition um, to actually getting the code to run, to reproduce, um, the point of making, of, of making analyses reproducible is, is being able to interact with them. I want to take someone's analysis. I want to play with it. I want to modify their parameters, test, you know, kind of stress test it. And I need to be able to, to interact with it in an easy way. I need to be able to find entry points into their code to, to modify their code to run it. Um, and so that's, I think, another major challenge to producing analyses that are reproducible um, in a nice way. So um, our goal of this talk is to, to present some strategies that make analyses exactly reproducible, kind of soup to nuts. But they also kind of have to be accessible. They have to be shareable. They better be able to be usable. You know, having a code that technically reproduces but nobody really wants to or can use it, not that useful. Um, and we want this to be a practical strategy, something you can adopt every day. Um, so it can't, hopefully, you know, our goal is to have something that's not too, doesn't have too many technical, um, technical problems when trying to actually do it. So our strategy, and the strategy that we found to be particularly useful is um, to problem one, actually running the code, is to, to use so-called containerization software. So in particular, we'll be looking at Docker. 
um, as a tool for, for code containerization. And the problem, too, of making things nice and easy to interact with, um, we think code notebooks, which has been, have been advocated several times already in this conference and will be again. We think they're, they're particularly nice. I won't hit that as hard because some other people have. Um, and particularly, we, we will recommend Jupyter and a plugin called JupyText, which we find to be very nice for making analyses easy to share. OK, so let's look at problem one, running the code. So our solution is containerization. So containerization is a, it's basically a virtualization technology. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the computing environment where the analysis is originally done, the data, the code, the dependencies, the software that was installed, and it's going to compress all of that into a kind of self-contained, shareable format. So it's compress all that into a file. There's a file I can take, I can give it to my friend. They can run that, and they will be dropped kind of magically into what is effectively the original computing environment where the analysis was done. So if they take the image and they run it, it will be kind of as if they were working on the computer where the analysis were originally done. And if that image is set up properly, then they should be able to perfectly reproduce the analysis. Um, so containerization is a type of, 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 of virtualization. Virtualization of um, Computing virus isn't new, um, it's, so containerization is kind of the, the latest incarnation of this. Um, but it's particularly lightweight and fast um, compared to some of the older stuff. It's kind of just virtualizing the high-level parts of the operating system. It's not kind of virtualizing hardware on up. Um, and so it, this file sizes are not tiny, but smaller than they might be. Um, they're particularly fast to start, run, um, and, and, and use. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this, this at a couple of different perspectives. I'm going to hit it once again at the high level. I'm going to give an example of what it looks like to actually use a containerized analysis. And then we'll talk real quick about um, how do you actually do this yourself for your analysis. So again, the high level is on the left there. I have my original computing environment. I do my analysis. I have all my stuff set up. I spend a lot of time setting up all the, the code and dependencies. What I can do is I can containerize that, compress it into an image file, I can take the image trial, I can upload it in the cloud, I can put it on an archive, I can get put it on the USB stick, I can give it to my friend, and they can go run it and it'll be kind of dropped into that original computing environment um, with everything set up theoretically so that it should perfectly um, reproduce the analysis. Um, so there are a lot of options out there for, for this kind of code, uh, environment containerization, code containerization analysis. Um, Docker is a very popular one. There's another one called Singularity, which is particularly popular for high-performance computing. Um, there's one called Podman, which is a kind of Red Hat um, re-implementation of Docker. Um, and so we use Docker, although there are some issues with that because um, it is slightly proprietary, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, okay, so I just want to give you, so I have a little video here, hopefully this will work what it looks like to run a containerized analysis. So here I'm on my command line on Windows. I'm going to use Docker. I say Docker run. I'm going to pass it some flags. It doesn't really matter what these are. They're mostly optional, but um, you can read our manuscript if you want to learn more about this. There are a lot of good tutorials. And then I pass it the name of the image. So basically, Docker run. I have some image file, more or less. I'm going to say run, the example I've downloaded. Hit Enter, and I'm going to be dropped into, after two, three seconds, I'm dropped into a new computing environment. You see my my um, command prompt has changed there. And I can do everything I would do kind of on a normal environment. So say here I look, I go to my desktop, I look at the files. On, in this container, there's an analysis file in, in R. There's a Penguin data set um, over here. And all of that is in the container. I don't have to have that on my original computer. And so I'm kind of dropped into that environment. I can do what I would do on, in a computing environment. I can look at the analysis code, um, look at the analysis code. Looks all nice, um, and uh, and I can actually run the analysis. So here I can actually use our script, and I can run the analysis, and it'll output a little plot for me. Now that implementation of our script that I use to run my analysis, I don't need R on my computer. That is in the container. It is already installed in the container, and it's the correct version to run the analysis. And the package I need, say ggplot for my analysis, I don't need that installed or configured on my computer. It's already been installed and configured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So if I on Windows, I've now dropped from Windows PowerShell into a Linux environment, which is actually kind of nice to having a Linux. I mean, Windows now is a subsystem on, but on, but you can give me, I can give my, I had to do my, give my students a uh, a nice little Linux environment. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And you saw just like that. 
then we can get this click right, just like that, dropped into this environment with everything set up. Of course, many people are not nerds like me. They don't like command line. So what we've been poking around with is trying to make this more easily accessible. So what I'll do here is I go to my web browser, go to localhost, and I'm brought up with a splash page and a bunch of ways to interact with my analysis in a more graphical way so that when I give my containerized analysis to someone, they can interact with it. So here I have a bunch of different options. We'll go through a, a couple of these real quick. So I can just browse on my web browser. I can browse the files. I could open up an analysis output. I could view it. So this is a, maybe a nicer, more graphical way of interacting with the analysis for a user who doesn't like command lines. I can open up a um, kind of pseudo desktop environment using no VNC. So here we have, it looks like I'm on some other desktop, but this is all just through my web browser. And I'm peering in through a window into my container and I can open a text editor. I could, I could do everything pretending like I'm on some other system and I kind of am. Um, and so there's a nice little desktop environment, which is, which is particularly nice. People like graphical interfaces often. I can also um, open up one of many different um, notebook um, uh, programs here. So I'll open up Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook. I'll open up Jupyter Lab. And again, I don't need to have Jupyter Lab installed on my computer. This is running from the container. So it's a window into the container. I could open up my analysis. And not only can I view it, I can rerun it. So I'll restart, restart the kernel here. I'll rerun the analysis. And I can play with and interact with this using the kind of the graphical tools that I would have used anyways on my desktop. But now I'm doing it in a container where everything's been perfectly set up to run. So while you do have to run, let me go to my next slide here. I, you know, I think it's a pretty simple from the viewpoint of a third party using the analysis. Oop. I do a some Docker run command. Okay, you got to interact a little bit with the command line. But then I can just go on my web browser. I can use the graphical, you know, interface of my favorite, you know, or maybe, you know, one of my favorite, you know, I could use... Jupyter, I could use RStudio. There's a web version of that. Um, and I can interact just as if I it were on my own computer, but I'm really doing all the analysis in the container. Question? Yeah. Uh, is this the idea mostly for the Docker setting? Like, you, can, you can make Docker have whatever conditions you want to want. Is there some kind of tech analysis you found that would best suit this idea? Yeah, so maybe I'll hit that a little bit at the end. I don't, I don't know if I have... There's a couple things here. One, uh, Let me hit it a little bit at the end if we have time. but. Um, I think, yeah, I think, well, let's, let's hold off for a second on that. But, um, okay. So, of course, the question is, how hard is it to actually do this, right? So, um, it, right, do I need a PhD in computer science to do this? Hopefully not, because I don't have one. So, um, what you need to do to, to, to containerize analysis, you need to kind of write a configuration file to set up the computing environment. Sounds daunting. But what you need to know is that, you don't actually have to do this from scratch. I don't have to program up a whole, you know, and do an install of a whole, you know, or compile, you know, whatever, Linux or something, right? What there is, there are repositories out there, being one, the predominant one being Docker Hub, where there are hundreds of thousands of base images off of which I can build. So I can bootstrap off of what's called a base image, which is a pre-configured environment, you know, Linux environment, you know, with R installed and R Studio installed. So all that's all set up, and then I just need to write a couple commands to copy over my data, copy over, you know, install a particular obscure package I need, and uh, I can bootstrap off of all the work that's already been done. So this is one of the real nice tool um, kind of features of containerization or of, 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 of Docker in particular well, in any of these. So here at the top here I have literally a, a, uh, a configuration file. Docker calls them Docker files. Um, so I'll go through. It is six lines long, so not that bad to write. Um, I say from, and I give it a base image. Here's a nice base image um, with uh, R already installed. Um, has R Studio. This is called Rocker. It's an R Docker um, image. That does almost all the heavy lifting. It gives me a Linux environment with R Studio and R installed. I set up a working directory, which is optional in line two. Maybe I installed ggplot2. Maybe I need some other packages. Just a couple commands to install stuff. I copy over my data, I copy over the analysis files, and I maybe at the end here I give it a little command to run. Um, that's the entire configuration file. So typically a configuration file isn't a lot of mucking around in low-level programming. It's copy over my data, copy over my analysis, maybe install some obscure packages. The commands are pretty simple to do that. And then at the bottom here I just run my docker run command, or docker build command, give it a name of whatever I want for, for my image, you know, 
Bob's your uncle. It, it completes it pretty quickly. It builds the image, uh, and uh, you get an image file, more or less, and you can share that with your friends, and you get a whole containerized uh, and computing environment that you can share to make sure your analysis is exactly reproducible. Okay, so that's two. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. So if, um, mm -hmm. if I'm building this, mm -hmm. how, how would you recommend approaching the creation of the Docker file mm. when, say, I'm not using a Linux environment to build it? This would be my initial dilemma. So is, mm. is there a step involved here with like taking the actual work I did and then maybe transforming it or doing some manipulation to get it in a state where I can use this sort of very simple workflow to create the Docker uh, environment? Yeah, so Docker is built, I mean, the original kind of containerization software is built on Linux, given that it's, so we'll talk about this at the end, that it's free and open source, right? There is a, win, a Windows version of Docker has some Windows support, but that is obviously gets complicated because stuff gets proprietary. Um, but I, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I think literally, you know, if I do my analysis, say, in, I, in a, a, a analysis script, I, I don't need to, do, like, I don't need to, I, I hope, worry too much about is it a Linux environment or not. The analysis should run on either. I take my analysis script, I put it on the new thing, and ultimately I don't have to even really care it's a, it's a Linux environment because when I interact with it, I'm just interacting through a web browser through Jupyter, and nobody you know, really tells is that running on Windows, is that running on Linux. So I th the hope is I think it's it's not so bad. But. So, so I think what you said is yeah. true. Yes, like, there is. Absolutely. Um, yep. Correct. Or, correct. But, but I would offer up that in mm. practice, um, you know, using Linux one layer to do various data manipulation mm -hmm. or kind of string together different functionality can be pretty useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and again, I was, I was going to hit this at the end, but I'll, I'll just preview it a little bit now. Yeah. If you have proprietary stuff is harder, not impossible. And, and so, you know, so I come from kind of a bioinformatics background, and I've kind of worked my way into into kind of engineering stats. The bioinformatics background, everything is open and shared. Everyone loves you know we'll share our, our data with our friends. Everything's open source. That's the way it works. Now that's not true as much in the in this community, and for good reasons often. And there is you know a lot of very good proprietary software. So what I would say is that you know I think proprietary software can be a hindrance to reproducibility for as seen here because it assumes that my colleague who I'm trying to share this with has a license or whatever. Proprietary software is often really nice and does a lot of benefits. And so I would say to those groups that build this stuff that we need to, we need to, you know, MATLAB has a Docker container that theoretically can get it to work. Your mileage may vary, but it would be good if these groups can think about how they could provide some kind of container. Maybe you have to input your license when you run the container or something so that we can use some of these this, this kind of proprietary software in a shareable way. Um, so it's a little afield in what you're saying, but yeah, I think uh, it's a related topic there. Okay, so let's see, because I'm running low on time. So I won't hit this too hard because some other people are hitting it nicely about notebooks are nice. Um, so code notebooks are kind of the latest in, in uh, what's called literate programming um, documents. So what they are is they're kind of series of text, data, and output all naturally kind of interweaved in um, in a in a in an analysis document. And so the, the the text can be basically anything you can write it in a web page. You can put it put in a text chunk. It can be images. It can be links. It can be LaTeX mathematics. It can be embedded. Lots of blah 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 blah. You can do lots of, of amazing rich text stuff there. Um, then you can write the line of code, and then you can see, like at the bottom here, that the code output is is immediately there. And um, we think that these are particularly nice um, code notebooks are a really nice way for ensuring reproducibility. And this has been hit a couple times, I think, already in this conference. Um, and uh, not only does the software often for something like Jupyter or Studio have a web interface that makes it easy to do this, which is using it through a web browser and interacting with the container through a web browser in a really nice kind of intuitive way. Um, it's, it, it, but the natural interweaving of kind of the rich text commentary, 
um, the code, the output, it encourages good programming practices, which is commenting on your code. It also encourages commenting on the science and the output, right? So a typical code comment, you're going to comment on the output typically. Um, so code notebooks allow that kind of interweaving. Um, and it's a nice way to, to enable kind of analysis uh, to, to documentation of your little micro decisions you make about analysis. Um, it's, a, it's a nice little check that if I have a plot in a notebook and I have the code that produced that plot, it's a good check that that code actually produced that plot. You know, in a, in a, in a fast-paced research environment, you're updating code and plots, you don't want them to kind of get out of sync. And so there is a kind of nice internal check that, oh, yeah, that code produced that figure because they're next to each other in that in that notebook. Yeah. Sorry. Question? No, go for it. Um, so Interaction's great. I'm, I'm focusing in on mm -hmm. this task, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I, I've recently been mm -hmm. kind of looking for, for this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take Jupyter mm -hmm. Lab, I would mm -hmm. say, yep. 3 version 3S, mm -hmm. right? I didn't think that it had this test. Nope. I thought it only had, like, like kind of basic, the most basic test. Is that not true? Nope. You, like, you can write LaTeX mathematics in it. No, I know you can, but what I'm thinking is, like, I want something that could be easy to use on Word, but I could still do a lot of the, um, the kind of, um, you know, indentation and formatting. Yeah, so it's, it's written using Markdown, right, which is supposedly, it's like writing HTML, but you don't have to write all of the horrible lines, yeah. right? So it's, it's supposed to be a simple, so yeah, it's written in Markdown. If you, if you like Word, mm, you know, there are, there, are, there are things to convert between, you know, Pandoc will convert between Word and Markdown, or try to, you know. Um, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, yeah. Definitely. Did it die? Yeah. 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 So you know, it takes a. It's not as bad as like writing a web page like horrible HTML, but you can. But it is really nice for display because I can embed a whole mathematical explanation of figure then have code that runs produces output you know so i think it's it's a, it's it's very nice and interactive um the last thing i want to hit here is that this whole paradigm of kind of containerizing analyses and using notebooks is really nice for providing different entry points in the code right so when i create an analysis and i want to make it reproducible i don't want to give someone a thousand line piece you know script that takes my raw data does 20 hours of processing and outputs some plots, right? Not particularly, it, like, technically, you know, is computationally reproducible, but not particularly useful, right? And so what we do in analysis and what you actually want to do is you take your raw data, you do some intermediate processing, you have some process data, you take that intermediate maybe a couple times, you produce some intermediate results, and eventually you get kind of your finer results and output. And what we should be doing is we should be caching intermediate results and so that the input, you know, the raw data gets processed, it's cached, then the second step of processing data reads that cache draw data, processes it, produces some inter other immediate step, and then we kind of go on from there. And you can do this iteratively multiple times, right? And I think notebooks provide a really, or notebooks and the containerization provide a really nice way of, of, of doing this because I can, I can containerize an entire environment, so I can organize the directory structure exactly how my my cache and immediate results need to be, so that my code knows exactly where they are. And so that when I give it to a third party, they have the code and the data. It's all perfectly set up. And if they don't want to sit for 10 hours of the raw processing because they don't care, they can just enter into the second step and take the process data and, you know, produce the final results or something like that. So I think um, that the uh, that this provides, a, 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 that containerization provides a nice, a nice way of doing this. Okay. Um, there are a bunch of different software out there for writing notebooks. Um, we particularly like Jupyter because it's free and open source. It's community driven. Our Markdown and our Studio are another option. Um, Zeppelin by Apache is another another option for doing this stuff. They're all kind of broadly similar, different benefits and and drawbacks. In particular, Jupyter and our Markdown and the Stats community right is particularly popular. I just want to draw your attention to is a plugin called Jupytext, which is a really nice plugin that will allow me to write my analysis in a Jupyter notebook, and then it maintains mirrored copies in an, uh, just a pure script in a R Markdown format, and of course in my in my Jupyter format. So what I can do is I it maintains a synchronous mirrored copy. So I do my analysis in my Jupyter notebook because I like that, and then it produces multiple copies. And so when I containerize that and I put it in my container, not only do I give them the Jupyter notebook, I give them a version of an R Markdown um, document. I give them just a raw script, and then I containerize Jupyter and R Studio and 
you know, just base version of R. So when I give it to my third-party collaborator, if they hate Jupyter, they don't have to use it. They can use R Markdown. If they like just mucking around in command line scripts, they can just, they can do that. So I love this, <laughs> this plugin, Jupyter. It is great. Um, and so again, it makes things more accessible to third parties, which is important if we want our results to actually be used and kind of reproduce them. Okay, so I'll just close on some final thoughts here. Um, first point being security. You know, I don't know if I have any concrete recommendations other than don't forward what your ports. Just do 80, uh, do, <laughs> if you're trying to get it work through a web browser, here's my only concrete thing. When I run my command, uh, whatever. If you're doing port forwarding, give it the actual localhost 127.0.0.1. Otherwise, you're exposing your ports to everyone on your network and they can come to your container. I, I think that, sorry, let's go down back to the end here. I think that though, I mean, if you set up the security settings, these things can actually be better for security than, you know, if I just can go download some random script off the web and run it on com my computer. Now, William Mary's going to let me do that. And my wife's at NASA, not going to be super into that, you know. Um, and also, if I just download some random script from someone I want to get just once run their analysis, and I get installed 10 packages and clutter up my system, that's just not nice, right? So by keeping it in a container, I keep all that garbage in a container, and then when I close it, it all, all kind of disappears. So I think if used correctly, they can actually kind of reduce clutter and increase security. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll say that I, I talked a little bit about data code and writes, right? There are repositories out there for cloud repositories for sharing the stuff. I know in this community, people don't necessarily want to share data, at least not to the whole world. Um, and so you can just have a local file that contains your stuff. Um, but again, proprietary software can be a hindrance straight up to, to reproducibility. Um, I think it's something people need to think about. Um, and I'll just, my one last closing point is I'll give a shout out to Zenodo, which is run by CERN, which is a nice um, place for sh sharing data. You put your data on there up to 20 gigs. Um, they give you a DOI you can reference. Um, and these images, maybe three, four, five gigs. So you can't put them on GitHub. You can't put them on a lot of places. But somewhere like Zenodo is a, is a nice place to host these things. Okay, with that, I will, I will end. I'll uh, put a little web, web page here if people want to find out more. All right, thanks, Greg. Yep. Um, um, there's a couple of questions coming in from, um, from Zoom. So let me just go ahead and read those. Uh, how do you recommend we get access to Docker? So far, we've been able, unable to get permission to use the software. That's gonna, I'm assuming that's an organizational yeah. issue, right? So, so all the stuff is, is implemented based on open source standards. So that's why someone, there's this group called, or group Red Hat has re-implemented Docker called Podman, which is kind of a, they can do it because it's open source. Docker, depending on your organization, might charge, but there are typically free alternatives. So I'm assuming typically the stuff is free depending on your organization, blah, blah, blah. So Okay, hopefully. thanks. Yeah. And the next one, do you have any experience using containerization with government IT security requirements? I, I don't. I have a little bit of peripheral experience through my wife with government IC security requirements. Um, I'm sympathetic. <laughs> uh, they're, they're they're doing their job, but uh, yeah, I'm at a university. It's a little more lax there. But I think it should be. I mean, it's something people should push for because I think it can actually enhance security if done correctly. Is what I'll say. So, so I have not directly, Good. but maybe maybe tangentially. So I was able to get a very nice compute environment set up. Hmm. Okay, let's thank Greg. Thanks, guys.